Chapter number thirty three of the House of Whispers by William Lacroix. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Is about the Maison Lenard. The big, rather severely but well furnished room overlooked the busy Boulevard des Capucines in Paris. In front lay the great white facade of the Grand Hotel. Below was all the bustle, life, and movement of Paris on a bright, sunny afternoon. Within the room, at a large mahogany table, sat four grave-faced men, while a fifth stood at one of the long windows, his back turned to his companions. The short, broad-shouldered man looking forth into the street, in expectancy, was Monsieur Goslin. He had been speaking, and his words had evidently caused some surprise, even alarm, among his companions, for they now exchanged glances in silence. Three of the men were well-dressed and prosperous-looking, while the fourth, a shriveled old fellow, in faded clothes which seemed several sizes too large for him, looked needy and ill-fed as he nervously chafed his thin bony hands. Next moment they all began chatting in French, though from their countenances it was plain that they were of various nationalities, one being German, the other Italian, and the third, a sallow-faced man, had the appearance of a Levinite. Goslin alone remained silent and watchful. From where he stood, he could see the people entering and leaving the Grand Hotel. He glanced impatiently at his watch, and then paced the room, his hand thoughtfully stroking his gray beard. Only half an hour before, he had alighted at the Gare du Nord, coming directly from far off Glencardine, and had driven there in an auto cab to keep an appointment made by telegram. As he paced the big room, with its dark green walls, its turkey carpet and somber furniture his companions regarded him in wonder they instinctively knew that he had some news of importance to impart there was one absentee until his arrival goslin refused to say anything the youngest of the four assembled at the table was the italian a rather thin keen-faced dark-moustached man of refined appearance madonna mia he cried raising his face to the frenchman why what has happened this is unusual. Besides, why should we wait? I've only just arrived from Turin, and haven't had time to go to the hotel. Let's get on. Avante. Not until he is present, answered Goslin, speaking earnestly in French. I have a statement to make from Sir Henry, but I'm not permitted to make it until all are here. Then, glancing at his watch, he added, his train was due at East Station at 4.58. He should be here at any moment. The shabby old man, by birth a Pole, still sat chafing his chilly fingers. None who saw Antoine Volkonsky, as he shuffled along the street, ever dreamed that he was head of the great financial house of Volonsky Frères of Petersburg, whose huge loans to the Russian government during the war with Japan had created a sensation throughout Europe. And surely no casual observer looking at that little assembly would ever entertain suspicion that, between them, they could practically dictate to the money market of Europe. The Italian seated next to him was, was the commentador Rudolf Cusini, head of the wealthy banking firm of Montmartini of Rome, which ranked next to the Bank of Italy. Of the remaining two, one was a Greek from Smyrna, and the other, a rather well-dressed man with longish gray hair, Joseph Freundmayer of Hamburg, a name also to conjure with in the financial world. The impatient Italian was urging Goslin to explain why the meeting had been so hastily summoned when, without warning, the door opened and a tall, distinguished man, with carefully trained gray mustache and wearing a heavy traveling ulster, entered. Ah, my dear Baron, cried the Italian, jumping from his chair and taking the newcomer's hand. We were waiting for you. And he drew a chair next to his. The man addressed tossed his soft felt traveling hat aside, saying, the wire reached me at my country house outside Vienna, where I was visiting. But I came instantly, and he seated himself, while the chair at the head of the table was taken by the stout Frenchman. Messieurs, Goslin commenced, and speaking in French, began apologizing at being compelled to call them together so soon after their last meeting. The manner, however, is of such urgency, he went on, that this conference is absolutely necessary. I am here in Sir Henry's place, with a statement from him, an alarming statement. Our enemies have unfortunately triumphed. What do you mean? 
cried the Italian, starting to his feet. Simply this, poor Sir Henry has been the victim of treachery. Those papers which you, my dear Volonsky, brought to me in secret at Glencardine a month ago have been stolen. Stolen? gasped the shabby old man, his gray eyes starting from his head. Stolen! Dia! Think what that means to us, to me, to my house. They will be sold to the Ministry of Finance in Petersburg, and I shall be ruined. Ruined! Not only you will be ruined, remarked the man from Hamburg, but our control of the market will be at an end. And together we lose over three million rubles, said Goslin in as quiet a voice as he could assume. The six men, those men who dealt in millions, men whose names, every one of them, were as household words on the various bourses of Europe and in banking circles, men who lent money to reigning sovereigns and to states, whose interests were worldwide and whose influences were greater than those of kings and ministers, looked at each other in blank despair. We have to face this fact, as Sir Henry points out to you, that at Petersburg the Department of Finance has no love for us. We put on the screw a little too heavily when we sold them secretly those three Argentine cruisers. We made a mistake in not being content with smaller profit. Yes, if it had been a genuinely honest deal on their side, remarked the Italian, but it was not. In Russia the crowd made quite as great a profit as we did and all three ships were sent to the bottom of the sea four months afterwards, added Fronmeyer with a grim laugh. That isn't the question, Goslin said. What we have now to face is the peril of exposure. No one can, of course, allege that we have ever resorted to any sharper practices than those of other financial groups. But the fact of our alliance and our impregnable strength will, when it is known, aroused the fiercest antagonism in certain circles. No one suspects the secret of our alliance, the Italian ejaculated. It must be kept, kept at all hazards. Each man seated there knew that exposure of the tactics by which they were ruling the Bourse would mean the sudden end of their great prosperity. But this is not the first occasion that documents have been stolen from Sir Henry at Glencardine, remarked the Baron Conrad de Hetzendorf. I remember the last time I went there to see him. He explained how he had discovered his daughter with the safe open and some of the papers actually in her hands. Unfortunately, that is so, Goslin answered. There is every evidence that we owe our present peril to her initiative. She and her father are in bad terms, and it seems more than probable that though she is no longer at Glencardine, she has somehow contrived to get hold of the documents in question at the instigation of her lover, we believe. How do you know that the documents are stolen? The Baron asked, because three days ago Sir Henry received an anonymous letter bearing the postmark of London, E.C., enclosing correct copies of the papers which our friend Volonsky brought from Petersburg, and asking what sum he was prepared to pay to obtain repossession of the originals. On receipt of the letter, continued Goslin, I rushed to the safe, to find the papers gone. The door had been unlocked and relocked by an unknown hand. And how does suspicion attach to the girl's lover? asked the man from Hamburg. Well, he was alone in the library for half an hour about five days before. He called to see Sir Henry while he and I were out walking together in the park. It is believed that the girl has a key to the safe which she handed to her lover in order that he might secure the papers and sell them in Russia. But young Murray is the son of a wealthy man, I've heard, observed the baron. Certainly, but at present his allowance is small, was Goslin's reply. Well, what's to be done? inquired the Italian. Done? echoed Goslin. Nothing can be done. Why? they all asked almost in one breath. Because Sir Henry has replied refusing to treat for the return of the papers. Was that not injudicious? Why did he not allow us to discuss the affair first? argued the Levantine. Because an immediate answer by telegraph to a post office in Hampshire was demanded. Goslin replied, Remember that to Sir Henry's remarkable foresight all our prosperity has been due. Surely we may trust in his judicious treatment of the thief. That is all very well, protested Volonsky. But my fortune is at stake. 
If the ministry obtains those letters, they will crush and ruin me. Sir Henry is no novice, remarked the baron. He fights an enemy with his own weapons. Remember the Greek deal of which the girl gained knowledge? He actually prepared bogus contracts and correspondence for the thief to steal. They were stolen and, passing through a dozen hands, were at last offered in Athens. The ministry there laughed at the thieves for their pains. Let us hope the same result will be now obtained. I fear not, Goslin said quietly. The documents stolen on the former occasion were worthless. The ones now in the hands of our enemies are genuine. But, said the baron, you, Goslin, went to live at Glencardine on purpose to protect our poor blind friend from his enemies. I know, said the man addressed. I did my best and failed. The footman Hill, knowing young Murray as a frequent guest at Glencardine, the other day showed him into the library and left him there alone. It was then, no doubt, that he opened the safe with a false key and secured the documents. Then why not apply for a warrant for his arrest? suggested the commendator Cusini. Surely your English laws do not allow thieves to go unpunished. In Italy we should quickly lay hands on them. But we have no evidence. You have no suspicion that any other man may have committed the theft. That fellow Flockhart, for instance? I don't like him, added the baron. He is altogether too friendly with everybody at Glencardine. I have already made full inquiries. Flockhart was in Rome. He only returned to London the day before yesterday. No. Everything points to the girl taking revenge upon her father, who, I'm compelled to admit, has treated her with rather undue harshness. Personally, I consider Mademoiselle very charming and intelligent. They all admitted that her correspondence and replies to reports were marvels of clear, concise instruction. Every man among them knew well her neat, round handwriting. Yet only Goslin had ever seen her. The Frenchman was asked to describe both the girl and her lover. This he did, declaring that Gabrielle and Walter were a very handsome pair. Whatever may be said, remarked old Wolonsky, the girl was a most excellent assistant to Sir Henry, but is, of course, the old story, a young girl's head turned by a handsome lover. Yet surely the youth is not so poor that he became a thief of necessity. To me it seems rather as though he stole the documents at her instigation. That is exactly Sir Henry's belief, Goslin remarked with a sigh. The poor old fellow is beside himself with fear and grief. No wonder, remarked the Italian, none of us would care to be betrayed by our own daughters. But cannot a trap be laid to secure the thief before he approaches the people in Russia? Suggested the crafty Levantine. Yes, yes, cried Volonsky, his hands still clenched. The ministry would give a hundred thousand rubles for them, because by their aid they could crush me, crush you all. Remember their names are there names of some of the most prominent officials in the empire. Think of the power of the ministry if they held that list in their hands. No, said Baron in a clear, distinct voice, his gray eyes fixed thoughtfully upon the wall opposite. Rather think of our positions, of the exultation of our enemies, if this great combine of ours were exposed and broken. Myself, I consider it folly that we have met here openly today. This is the first time we have all met, save in secret, and how do we know but some spy may be on the boulevard outside, noting who has entered here? Mi diavale, gasped Cusini, striking the table with his fist and sinking back into his chair. I recollect I passed outside here a man I know, a man who knows me. He was standing on the curb. He saw me. His name is Crail, Felix Crail. Is he still there? cried the men as with one accord they left their chairs and dashed eagerly across to the window. Crail, cried the Russian in alarm. Where is he? See, the Italian pointed out. See the man in black yonder, standing there near the kiosk, smoking a cigarette? He is still watching. He has seen us meet here. Ah, said the baron in a hoarse voice, I said so. To meet openly like this was far too great a risk. Nobody knew anything of Leonard et Morale of the Boulevard des Capuchins, except that they were unimportant financiers. Tomorrow the world will know who they really are. Messieurs, we are the victims of a very clever ruse. 
we have been so tricked that we have been actually summoned here and our identity disclosed the five monarchs of finance stood staring at each other in absolute silence End of chapter 33「thirty four of the House of Whispers by William Lacroix. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Surprises Mr. Flockhart. Well, you and your friend Felix have placed me in a very pleasant position, haven't you? asked Lady Hayburn of Flockhart, who had just entered the green and white morning room at Park Street. I hope now that you're satisfied with your blunder. The man addressed in a well cut suit of grey a fancy vest and patent leather boots still carrying his hat and stick in his hand turned to her in surprise what do you mean he asked i arrived from paris at five this morning and i've brought you good news nonsense cried the woman starting from her chair in anger you can't deceive me any longer crail discovered the whole game the syndicate held a meeting at the office in paris he and i watched the arrivals we now know who they are and exactly what they are doing by jove we never dreamed that your husband blind though he is is head of such a smart and influential group why they're the first in europe what does that matter Crail wants money so do we but with all your wonderful schemes we get none wait my dear winnie remain patient and we shall obtain plenty it was indeed strange for a woman within that smart townhouse and with her electric brougham at the door to complain of poverty the house had been a centre of political activity in the days before sir henry met with the terrible affliction the room in which the pair stood had been the scene of many a private and momentous conference and in the big drawing-room upstairs many a cabinet minister had bent over the hand of the fair lady Hayburn. into the newly decorated room with its original atom ceiling its dead white panelling and antique overmantel shone the morning sun weak and yellow as it always is in london in the springtime lady hayburn dressed in a smart walking-gown of grey pushed her fluffy fair hair from her brow while upon her face was an expression which told of combined fear and anger her visitor was surprised after that watchful afternoon in the boulevard des capuchines he had sat in a corner of the cafe triminus listening to crail who rubbed his hands with delight and declared that he now held the most powerful group in europe in the hollow of his hand for the past six years or so gigantic coups had been secured by that unassuming and apparently third-rate financial house of lenard et morellet from a struggling firm they had within a year grown into one whose wealth seemed inexhaustible and whose balances at the credit Lyonnais, the societe generale and the comptoir d'escompte were possibly the largest of any of the customers of those great corporations the financial world of europe had wondered it was a mystery who was behind lenard et morellet the pair of steady-going highly respectable business men who lived in unostentatious comfort the former at Eguin, just outside paris and the latter out in the country at malum the mystery was so well and so carefully preserved that not even the bankers themselves could obtain knowledge of the truth Crail had however after nearly two years of clever watching and ingenious subterfuge succeeded by placing the group in a hole in calling them together that they met and often was undoubted but where they met and how was still a complete mystery as flockhart had sat that previous afternoon listening to Crail's unscrupulous and self-confident proposals he had remained in silent wonder at the man's audacious attitude nothing deterred him nothing daunted him flockhart had returned that night from paris gone to his chambers in half moon street breakfasted dressed and had now called upon her ladyship in order to impart to her the good news yet instead of welcoming him she only treated him with resentment and scorn he knew the quick flash of those eyes he had seen it before on other occasions this was not the first time they had quarrelled yet he keen-witted and cunning had always held her powerless to elude him had always compelled her to give him the sums he so constantly demanded that morning however she was distinctly resentful distinctly defiant for an instant he turned from her biting his lip in annoyance 
when facing her again he smiled asking tell me winnie what does all this mean mean echoed the baronet's wife mean how can you ask me that question look at me a ruined woman and you speak out he cried what has happened you surely know what has happened you have treated me like the cur you are and that is speaking plainly you've sacrificed me in order to save yourself from what from exposure to me ruin is not a matter of days but of hours you're speaking in enigmas i don't understand you he cried impatiently Crail and i have at last been successful we know now the true source of your husband's huge income and in order to prevent exposure he must pay and pay us well too yes she laughed hysterically you tell me after all this you've blundered blundered how he asked surprised at her demeanour what's the use of beating about the bush asked her ladyship the girl is back at glencardine she knows everything thanks to your foolish self-confidence back at glencardine gasped flockhart but she dare not speak by heaven if she does then then and what pray can you do inquired the woman harshly it is i who have to suffer i who am crushed humiliated ruined while you and your precious friend shield yourselves behind your cloaks of honesty you are sir henry's friend he believes you as such you and she laughed the hollow laugh of a woman who was staring death in the face she was haggard and drawn and her hands trembled with the nervousness which she strove in vain to repress lady heyburn was desperate he still believes in me eh asked the man thinking deeply for his clever brain was already active to devise some means of escape from what appeared to be a distinctly awkward dilemma he had never calculated the chances of gabrielle's return to her father's side he had believed that impossible i understand that my husband will hear no word against you replied the tall fair-haired woman but when i speak he will listen depend upon it you dare he cried turning upon her in a threatening attitude you dare utter a single word against me and by heaven i'll tell what i know the country shall ring with a scandal the shame of your attitude towards the girl and a crime for which you will be arraigned with me before an assize court remember the woman shrank from him her face had blanched she saw that he was equally as determined as she was desperate james flockhart always kept his threats he was by no means a man to trifle with for a moment she was thoughtful then she laughed defiantly in his face speak say what you will but if you do you suffer with me your exposure is eminent he remarked how did the girl manage to return to glencardine with walter's aid he went down to wood newton what passed between them i have no idea i only returned the day before yesterday from the south all i know is that the girl is back with her father and he knows much more than he ought to know murray could not have assisted her flockhart declared decisively the old man suspects him of taking those russian papers from the safe how do you know he hasn't cleared himself of the suspicion he may have done the old man dotes upon the girl i know that and she may have turned upon you and told the truth about the safe incident that's more than likely she dare not utter a word you're far too self-confident it's your failing and when pray has it failed tell me never until the present moment your bluff is perfect yet there are moments when it cannot aid you depend upon it she told me one night long ago in my own room when she had disobeyed defied and annoyed me that she would never rest until sir henry knew the truth and that she would place before him proofs of the other affair she has long intended to do this and now thanks to your attitude of passive inertness she has accomplished her intentions what he gasped in distinct alarm has she told her father the truth a telegram i received from sir henry late last night makes it only too plain that he knows something responded the unhappy woman staring straight before her it is your fault your fault she went on turning suddenly upon her companion again i warned you of the danger long ago flockhart stood motionless the announcement which the woman had made staggered him felix crail had come to him in paris and after some hesitation and with some reluctance had described how he had followed the girl along the nen bank and thrown her into the deepest part of the river knowing that she would be hampered by her skirts and that she could not swim 
she will not trouble us further never fear he had said it will be thought a case of suicide through love her mental depression is the common talk of the neighborhood and yet the girl was safe and now home again in glencardine he reflected upon the ugly facts of the other affair to which her ladyship sometimes referred and his face went ash and pale just at the moment when success had come to them after all their ingenuity and all their endeavours just a moment when they could demand and obtain what terms they liked from sir henry to preserve the secret of the financial combine came this catastrophe felix was a fool to have left his work only half done he remarked aloud as though speaking to himself what work asked the hollow-eyed woman eagerly but he did not satisfy her to explain would only increase her alarm and render her even more desperate than she was did i not tell you often that from her we had all to fear cried the woman frantically but you would not listen and now i am i am face to face with the inevitable disaster is before me no power can avert it the girl will have a bitter and terrible revenge no he cried quickly with fierce determination no i'll save you winnie the girl shall not speak i'll go up to glencardine to-night and face it out you will come with me i gasped the shrinking woman ah no i i couldn't i dare not face him you know too well i dare not End of chapter thirty four chapter thirty five of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain discloses a secret the gray mists were still hanging upon the hills of glencardine although it was already midday, for it had rained all night, and everywhere was damp and chilly. Gabrielle, in her short tweed skirt, golf cape, and motor cap, had strolled, with Walter Murray at her side, from the house along the winding path to the old castle. From the contented expression upon her pale, refined countenance, it was plain that happiness, to a great extent, had been restored to her. When he had gone to Wood Newton, it was to fetch her back to Glencardine he had asked for an explanation it was true but when she had refused one he had not pressed it that he was puzzled sorely puzzled was apparent at first sir henry had point-blank refused to receive his daughter but on hearing her appealing voice he had to some extent relented and though strained relations still existed between them yet happiness had come to her in the knowledge that walters's affection was still as strong as ever young murray had of course heard from his mother the story told by lady hayburn concerning the offence of her stepdaughter but he would not believe a single word against her they had been strolling slowly and she had been speaking expressing her heartfelt thanks for his action in taking her from that life of awful monotony at wood newton then he on his part had pressed her soft hand and repeated his promise of lifelong love they had entered the old grass-grown courtyard of the castle when suddenly she had exclaimed how i wish walter that we might elucidate the secret of the whispers it certainly would be intensely interesting if we could he said the most curious thing is that my old friend edgar hamilton who is secretary to the well-known baron conrad de hetzendorf tells me that a similar legend is current in connection with the old chateau in hungary he had heard the whispers himself most remarkable she exclaimed gazing blankly around at the ponderous walls about her my idea always has been that beneath where we are standing there must be a chamber for most medieval castles had a subterranean dungeon beneath the courtyard ah if we could only find entrance to it cried the girl enthusiastically shall we try have you not often tried and failed he asked laughingly yes but let's search again she urged my strong belief is that entrance is not to be obtained from this side but from the glen down below yes no doubt in the ages long ago the hill was much steeper than it is now and there were no trees or undergrowth on that side it was impregnable the river however in receding silted up much earth and boulders at the bend and has made the ascent possible together they went to a breach in the ponderous walls and peered down into the ancient river bed now but a rippling burn very well replied murray let us descend and explore so they retraced their steps until when about halfway to the house they left the path and went down to the bottom of the beautiful glen until they were immediately beneath the old castle the spot was remote and seldom visited 
few ever came there for it was approached by no path on that side of the burn so that the keepers always passed along the opposite bank they had no necessity to penetrate there besides it was too near the house through the bracken and undergrowth passing by big trees that in the ages had sprung up from seedlings dropped by the birds or sown by the winds they slowly ascended to the frowning walls far above the walls that had withstood so many sieges and the ravages of so many centuries half a dozen times the girl's skirt became entangled in the briars and once she tore her cape upon some thorns but enjoying the adventure she went on walter going first and clearing away for her as best he could nobody has ever been up here before i'm quite certain gabrielle cried halting breathless for a moment old stuart who says he knows every inch of the estate has never climbed here i'm sure i don't expect he has declared her lover at last they found themselves beneath the foundations of one of the flanking towers of the castle walls whereupon he suggested that if they followed the wall right along and examined it closely they might discover some entrance i somehow fear there will not be any door on the exposed side he added the base of the walls was all along hidden by thick undergrowth therefore the examination proved extremely difficult nevertheless keenly interested in their exploration the pair kept on struggling and climbing until the perspiration rolled off both their faces suddenly walter uttered a cry of surprise why look here this seems like a track people have been up here after all and his companion saw that from the burn below up through the bushes ran a narrow winding path which showed little sign of frequent use walter went on before her quickly following the path until it turned at right angles and ended before a low door of rough wood which filled a small breach in the wall a breach made in all probability at the last siege in the early seventeenth century this must lead somewhere cried walter excitedly and lifting the roughly constructed wooden latch he pushed the door open disclosing a cavernous darkness a dank earthy smell greeted their nostrils it was certainly an uncanny place by jove cried walter i wonder where this leads to and taking out his vestas he struck one and holding it before him went forward passing through the breach in the broken wall into a stone passage which led to the left for a few yards and gave entrance to exactly what gabrielle had expected a small windowless stone chamber probably used in olden days as a dungeon here they found to their surprise several old chairs a rough table formed of two deal planks upon trestles and a couple of half-burned candles in candlesticks which gabrielle recognized as belonging to the house these were lit and by their aid the place was thoroughly examined upon the floor was a heap of black tinder where some papers had been burnt weeks or perhaps months ago there were cigar ends lying about showing that whoever had been there had taken his ease in a niche was a small tin box containing matches and fresh candles while in a corner lay an old newspaper limp and damp bearing a date six months before on the floor too were a number of pieces of paper a letter torn to fragments they tried to piece it together laying it upon the table carefully but were unsuccessful in discovering its import save that it was in russian from somebody in odessa and addressed to sir henry carrying the candles in their hands they went into the narrow passage to explore the subterranean regions of the old place but neither way could they proceed far for the passage had fallen in at both ends and was blocked by rubbish the only exit or entrance was by that narrow breach in the walls so cunningly concealed by the undergrowth and closed by the rudely made door of planks nailed together above in the stone roof of the chamber there was a wide crack running obliquely and through which any sound could be heard in the courtyard above they remained in the narrow low-roofed little cell for a full half hour making careful examination of everything and discussing the probability of the whispers heard in the courtyard above emanating from that hidden chamber for what purpose was that place used and by whom in all probability it was the very chamber in which cardinal Citone had been treacherously done to death though they made a most minute investigation they discovered nothing further up to a certain point their explorations had been crowned by success yet the discovery rather tended to increase the mystery than diminish it that the whispers were supernatural gabrielle had all along refused to believe the question was to what use that secret chamber was put at last more puzzled than ever the pair having extinguished the candles 
emerged again into the light of day closing and latching the little door after them then following the narrow secret path they found that it wound through the bushes and emerged by a circuitous way some distance along the glen its entrance being carefully concealed by a big lichen covered boulder which hid it from any one straying there by accident so near was it to the house and so well concealed that no keeper had ever discovered it well declared gabrielle we've certainly made a most interesting discovery this morning but i wonder if it really does solve the mystery of the whispers scarcely walter admitted we have yet to discover to whom the secret of the existence of that chamber is known no doubt the whispers are heard above through the crack in the roof therefore at present we had better keep our knowledge strictly to ourselves and to this the girl of course agreed they found sir henry seated alone in the sunshine in one of the big bay windows of the drawing-room a pathetic figure with his blank bespeckled countenance turned towards the light and his fingers busily knitting to employ the time which alas hung so heavily upon his hands truth to tell with flockhart's influence upon him he was not quite convinced of the sincerity of either gabrielle or walter murray therefore when they entered and his daughter spoke to him his greeting was not altogether cordial why dear dad how is it you're sitting here all alone i would have gone for a walk with you had i known i'm expecting goslin was the old man's snappy reply he left paris yesterday and should certainly have been here by this time i can't make out why he hasn't sent me a wire explaining the delay he may have lost his connection in london murray suggested perhaps so remarked the baronet with a sigh his fingers moving mechanically murray could see that he was unnerved and unlike himself he of course was unaware of the great interest depending upon the theft of those papers from his safe but the old man was anxious to hear from goslin what had occurred at the urgent meeting of the secret syndicate in paris gabrielle was chatting gaily with her father in an endeavour to cheer him up when suddenly the door opened and flockhart still in his travelling ulster entered exclaiming good morning sir henry why my dear flockhart this is really quite unexpected i i thought you were abroad cried the baronet his face brightening as he stretched out his hand for his visitor to grasp so i have been i only got back to town yesterday morning and left euston last night well said sir henry i'm very glad you are here again i've missed you very much very much indeed i hope you'll make another long stay with us at glencardine the man addressed raised his eyes to gabrielle's she looked him straight in the face defiant and unflinching the day of her self-sacrifice to protect her helpless father's honour and welfare had come she had suffered much in silence suffered as no other girl would suffer but she had tried to conceal the bitter truth her spirit had been broken she was obsessed by one fear one idea for a moment the girl held her breath walter saw the sudden change in her countenance and wondered then with a calmness that was surprising she turned to her father and in a clear distinct voice said dad now that mr flockhart has returned i wish to tell you the truth concerning him to warn you that he is not your friend but your very worst enemy what is it you say cried the man accused glaring at her repeat those words and i will tell the whole truth about yourself here before your lover the blind man frowned he hated scenes come come he urged please do not quarrel gabrielle i think dear your words are scarcely fair to our friend father she said firmly her face pale as death i repeat them that man standing there is as much your enemy as he is mine flockhart laughed satirically then i will tell my story and let your father judge whether you are a worthy daughter he said End of chapter thirty five chapter thirty six of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain in which gabrielle tells a strange story gabrielle fell back in fear her handsome countenance was blanched to the lips this man intended to speak to tell the terrible truth and before her lover too she clenched her hands and summoned all her courage flockhart laughed at her laughed in triumph i think you gabrielle he said that you should put an end to this deceit towards your poor blind father 
"'What do you mean?' cried Walter in a fury, advancing towards Flockhart. "'What has this question, whatever it is, to do with you? "'Is it your place to stand between father and daughter?' "'Yes,' answered the other in cool defiance. "'It is. I am Sir Henry's friend.' "'His friend? His enemy?' "'You are not my father's friend, Mr. Flockhart,' declared the girl, "'noticing the look of pain upon the afflicted old gentleman's face. "'You have all along conspired against him for years, "'and you are actually conspiring with Lady Hayburn at this moment.' "'You lie!' he cried. "'You say this in order to shield yourself. "'You know that your mother and I are aware of your crime "'and have always shielded you.' "'Crime?' gasped Walter Murray, utterly amazed. "'What is this man saying, dearest?' but the girl stood blanched and rigid her jaw set unable to utter a word let me tell you briefly flockhart went on lady hayburn and myself have been this girl's best friends but now i must speak openly in defence of the allegation she is making against me yes speak urged sir henry speak and tell the truth it is a painful truth sir henry would that i were not compelled to make such a charge your daughter deliberately killed a young girl named Edna Bryant. She poisoned her on account of jealousy. Impossible, cried Sir Henry, starting up. I, I can't believe it. Flockhart, what are you saying? My daughter a murderess? Yes, I repeat my words. And not only that, but Lady Hayburn and myself have kept her secret until, until now, it is imperative that the truth should be told to you. Let me speak, Dad, let me tell you no cried the old man i will hear flockhart and turning to his wife's friend he said hoarsely go on tell me the truth the tragedy took place at a picnic just before gabrielle left her school at amiens she placed poison in the girl's wine ah it was a terrible revenge i am innocent cried the girl in despair remember the letter which you wrote to your mother concerning her you told lady hibbard that you hated her do you deny writing that letter because if you do it is still in existence i deny nothing which i have done she answered you have told my father this in order to shield yourself you have endeavoured as the coward you are to prejudice me in his eyes as you compelled me to lie to him when you opened his safe and copied certain of his papers you opened the safe he protested why i found you there myself enough she exclaimed quite coolly I know the dread charge against me. I know too well the impossibility of clearing myself, especially in the face of that letter I wrote to Lady Hayburn. But it was you and she who entrapped me, and who held me in fear because of my inexperience. Tell us the truth, the whole truth, darling, urged Murray, standing at her side and taking her hand confidently in his. The truth, she said in a strange voice, as though speaking to herself. Yes, let me tell you. I know that it will sound extraordinary, yet I swear to you by the love you bear for me, Walter, that the urds I am about to utter are the actual truth. I believe you, declared her lover reassuringly. Which is more than anyone else will, interposed Flockhart with a sneer, but perfectly confident. It was the hour of his triumph. She had defied him, and he therefore intended to ruin her once and for all. The girl was standing pale and erect, one hand grasping the back of a chair, the other held in her lover's clasp. While her father had risen, his expressionless face turned towards them, his hand groping until it touched a small table upon which stood an old punch bowl full of sweet-smelling potpourri. "'Listen, Dad,' she said, heedless of Flockhart's remark, "'hear me before you condemn me. I know that the charge made against me by this man is a terrible one.' God alone knows what I have suffered these last two years, how I have prayed for deliverance from the hands of this man and his friends. It happened a few months before I left Amiens. Lady Hayburn, you'll recollect, rented a pretty flat in the Rue Léonce, Renault in Paris. She obtained permission for me to leave school and visit her for a few weeks. I recalled perfectly, remarked her father in a low voice. Well, there came many times to visit us an American girl named Bryant, who was studying art and who lived somewhere off the Boulevard Michel, as well as a Frenchman named Felix Crail and an Englishman called Hamilton. Hamilton, echoed Murray. Was his name Edgar Hamilton, my friend? 
Yes, the same, was her quiet reply. Then she turned to Murray and said, We all went about a great deal together, for it was summer time, and we made many pleasant excursions in the district. Edna Bryant was a merry, cheerful girl, and I soon grew to be very friendly with her, until one day Lady Hayburn, when alone with me, repeated in strict confidence that the girl was secretly devoted to you, Walter. To me? he cried. True, I knew a Miss Bryant long ago, but for the past three years or so have entirely lost sight of her. Lady Hayburn told me that you were very fond of the girl, and this, I confess, aroused my intense jealousy. I believe that the girl I had trusted so implicitly was unprincipled and fickle, and that she was trying to secure the man whom I had loved ever since a child. I had to return to school, and from there I wrote to Lady Hayburn, who had gone too deep, a letter saying hard things of the girl, and declaring that I would take secret revenge, that I would kill her rather than allow Walter to be taken from me. A month afterwards I again returned to Paris. That man standing there, she indicated Flockhart, was living at the Hotel Continental, and was a frequent visitor. He told me that it was well known in London that Walter admired Miss Bryant. A declaration that I admit drove me half mad with jealousy. It was a lie, declared Walter. I never made love to the girl. I admired her, that's all. Well, laughed Flockhart, go on, tell us your versions of the affair. I am telling you the truth, she cried, boldly facing him. One day, Lady Hayburn, having arranged a cycling picnic, invited Mr. Hamilton, Mr. Crail, Mr. Flockhart, Miss Bryant, and myself, and we had a beautiful run to Chantilly, a distance of about forty kilometers, where we first made a tour of the old chateau, and afterwards entered the cool shady forêt de Pontarmé, while the others went away to explore the paths in the splendid wood I was left to spread the luncheon upon the ground setting before each place a half bottle of red wine which i found in the baskets then when all was ready i called to them but there was no response they were all out of hearing i left the spot and searched for a full twenty minutes or so before i discovered them first i found mr crail and mr flockhart strolling together smoking while the others were on ahead they had lost their way among the trees i led them back to the spot where luncheon was prepared and all of us being hungry, we quickly sat down, chatting and laughing merrily. Of a sudden, Miss Bryant stared straight before her, dropped her glass and threw up her arms. Heavens! Why, ah, my throat! She shrieked. I, I'm poisoned! In an instant, all was confusion. The poor girl could not breathe. She tore at her throat, while her face became convulsed. We obtained water for her, but it was useless for within five minutes she was stretched rigid upon the grass, unconscious, and a few moments later she was still quite dead. Ah, shall I ever forget the scene? The effect produced upon us all was appalling. All was so sudden, so tragic, so horrible. Lady Hayburn was the first to speak. Gabrielle, she said, what have you done? You have carried out the secret revenge, which in your letter you threatened. I saw myself trapped. Those people had some motive in killing the girl and placing the crime upon myself. I could not speak, for I was utterly dumbfounded. The fiends! ejaculated Walter fiercely. They followed a hurried consultation in which Crail showed himself most solicitous on my behalf. The pale-faced girl went on. Aided by Flockhart, I think, he scraped away a hole in the pit full of dead leaves, and there the body must have been concealed just as it was. To me, they all took a solemn vow to keep what they had declared to be my secret. The bottle containing the wine from which the poor American girl had drunk was broken and hidden. The plates and food swiftly packed up, and we at once fled from the scene of the tragedy. With Crail wheeling the girl's empty cycle, we reached the high road, where we all mounted and rode back in silence to Paris. Ah, shall I ever rid myself of the memory of that fatal afternoon? she cried as she paused for breath. Fearing that he might be noticed taking along the empty cycle, Crail threw it into the river near Valmodos. She went on. Arrived back at the Rue Léonce Renault, I protested that nothing had been introduced into the wine. 
but they declared that owing to my youth and the terrible scandal it would cause if i were arrested they would never allow the matter to pass their lips mr hamilton indeed making the extraordinary declaration that such a crime had extenuating circumstances when love was at stake i then saw that i had fallen the victim of some clever conspiracy but so utterly overcome was i by the awful scene that i could make but faint protest ah think of my horrible position accused of a crime of which i was entirely innocent the days slipped on and i was sent back to amiens and in due course came home here to dear old glencardine from that day i have lived in constant fear until on the night of the ball at Conican. you remember the evening dad on that night mr flockhart returned in secret beckoned me out upon the lawn and showed me something which held me petrified in fear it was a cutting from an edinburgh paper that evening reporting that two of the forest guards at Pontarn had discovered the body of the missing miss bryant and that the french police were making active inquiries he threatened you asked walter he told me to remain quiet and that he and lady heyburn would do their best to shield me for that reason dad she went on turning to the blind man for that reason i feared to denounce him when i discovered him with your safe open for that reason i was compelled to take all the blame and all your anger upon myself the old man's brow knit where's my wife he asked i must speak to her before we go further this is a very serious matter lady heyburn is still at park street flockhart replied i will hear no more declared the blind baronet holding up his hand not another word until my wife is present End of chapter 36「thirty seven of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain increases the interest but dad cried gabrielle i'm telling you the truth cannot you believe me your daughter before this man who is your enemy because of my affliction i am it seems deceived by every one was his hard response to where they stood had come the sound of wheels upon the gravel drive outside and a moment later hill entered announcing a gentleman to see you very urgently sir henry he is from baron de hetzendorf from the baron gasped the blind man i'll see him later why it may be hamilton cried murie who looking through the door saw his old friend in the corridor and quickly called him in as he faced flockhart he drew himself up the attitude of them all made it apparent to him that something unusual was in progress you've arrived at a very opportune moment hamilton murray said you have met miss heyburn before and also flockhart i believe at lady heyburn's in paris yes but sir henry walter said in a quiet tone this gentleman sent by the baron is his secretary the same mr edgar hamilton of whom gabrielle has just been speaking ah then perhaps he can furnish us with further facts regarding this most extraordinary statement of my daughter's the blind man exclaimed gabrielle has just told her father the truth regarding a certain tragic occurrence in the forest of pontarme explain to us all you know edgar what i know said hamilton is very quickly told has miss heyburn mentioned the man crail yes i have told them about him the girl answered you have however perhaps omitted to mention one or two small facts in connection with the affair he said do you remember how on that eventful afternoon in the forest when searching for us you first encountered crail walking with this man flockhart at some distance from the others yes i recollect and do you remember that when we returned to sit down to luncheon flockhart insisted that i should take the seat which was afterwards occupied by the unfortunate miss bryant do you recollect how i spread a rug for her at that spot and preferred myself to stand the reason for their invitation to me to sit there i did not discover until afterwards that wine had been prepared for me not for her for you the girl gasped amazed yes the plot was undoubtedly this there was no plot protested flockhart interrupting this girl killed edna bryant through intense jealousy i repeat that there was a foul and ingenious plot to kill me and to entrap miss heyburn hamilton said it was of course 
clear that miss heyburn was jealous of the girl for she had written to her mother making threats against miss bryan's life therefore the plot was that i should drink the fatal wine and that miss gabrielle should be declared to be the murderess she having intended the wine to be partaken of by the girl she hated with such deadly hatred the marked cordiality of crail and flockhart that i should take that seat aroused within me some misgivings although i had never dreamed of this dastardly and cowardly plot against me not until i saw the result of their foul handiwork it's a lie you are trying to implicate crail and myself the girl is the only guilty person she placed the wine there she did not declared hamilton boldly she was not there when the bottle was changed by crail but i was if what you say is true then you deliberately stood by and allowed the girl to drink i watched crail go to the spot where luncheon was laid out but could not see what he did if i had done so i should have saved the girl's life you were a few yards off awaiting him therefore you knew his intentions and you are as guilty of that girl's tragic death as he what cried flockhart his eyes glaring angrily do you declare then that i am a murderer you yourself are the best judge of your own guilt answered hamilton meaningly i deny that crail or myself had any hand in the affair you will have an opportunity of making that denial in a criminal court ere long remarked the baron's secretary with a grim smile what gasped lady heyburn's friend his cheeks paling in an instant have you been so indiscreet as to inform the police i have a week ago i made a statement to m hamard of the surete in paris and they have already made a discovery which you will find of interest and somewhat difficult to disprove and pray what is that hamilton smiled again saying no my dear sir the police will tell you themselves all in due course remember you and your precious friend plotted to kill me but why mr hamilton inquired the blind man what was their motive a very strong one was the reply i had recognized in crail a man who had defrauded the baron de hetzendorf of fifty thousand kroners and for whom the police were in active search both for that and for several other serious charges of a similar character crail knew this and he and his friend this gentleman here had very ingeniously resolved to get rid of me by making it appear that miss gabrielle had poisoned me by accident a lie declared flockhart fiercely though his efforts to remain imperturbed were now palpable you will be given due opportunity of disproving my allegations hamilton said you coward that you are place the guilt upon an innocent inexperienced girl why because with lady heyburn's connivance you with your cunning accomplice crail were endeavouring to discover sir henry's business secrets in order first to operate upon the valuable financial knowledge you would thus gain and so make a big coup and secondly when you had done this it was your intention to expose the methods of sir henry and his friends ah don't imagine that you and crail have not been very well watched of late laughed hamilton do you allege then that lady heyburn is privy to all this asked the blind man in distress it is not for me to judge sir was hamilton's reply i know i know how i have been befooled cried the poor helpless man befooled because i am blind not by me sir henry protested flockhart by you and by every one else he cried angrily but i know the truth at last the truth how my poor little daughter has been used as an instrument by you in your nefarious operations but hear me i say went on the old man i ask my daughter to forgive me for misjudging her i now know the truth you obtained by some means a false key to my safe and you copied certain documents which i had placed there in order to entrap any who might seek to learn my secrets you fell into that trap and though i confess i thought that gabrielle was the culprit on murray's behalf i only lately found out that you and your accomplice crail were in greece endeavouring to profit by knowledge obtained from here my private house crail has been living in octeradar of late it appears hamilton remarked and it is evidently he who gaining access to the house one night recently used his friends as false key and obtained those confidential russian documents from your safe no doubt declared sir henry then again addressing flockhart he asked 
where are those documents which you and your scoundrelly accomplice have stolen and for the return of which you are trying to make me pay i don't know anything about them answered flockhart sullenly his face livid he'll know more about them when he is taken off by the two detectives from edinburgh who hold the extradition warrant hamilton remarked with a grim smile the fellow started at those words his demeanour was that of a guilty man what do you mean he gasped white as death you you intend to give me into custody if you do i warn you that lady Hayburn will suffer also she like miss gabrielle has only been your tool hamilton declared it was she who under compulsion has furnished you with means for years and whose association with you has caused something little short of a scandal times without number she has tried to get rid of you and your evil influence in this household but you have always defied her now he said firmly looking the other straight in the face you have upon you those stolen documents which you have by using an assumed name and a false address offered to sell back to their owner sir henry you have threatened that if they are not purchased at the exorbitant price you demand you will sell them to the russian ministry of finance that is the way you treat your friend and benefactor the man who is blind and helpless come give them back to sir henry and at once you must ask crail stammered the man now so cornered that all further excuse or denial had become impossible that's unnecessary i happen to know that those papers are in your pocket at this moment a fact which shows how watchful an eye we've been keeping upon you of late you have brought them here so that your friend crail may come to terms with sir henry for their repossession he arrived from london with you and is at the strathaven arms in the village where he stayed before and is well known flockhart demanded the blind man very seriously you have papers in your possession which are mine return them to me a dead silence fell all eyes save those of sir henry were turned upon the man who until that moment had stood so defiant and so full of sarcasm but in an instant at mention of Crails's presence in octeradar his demeanour had suddenly changed he was full of alarm give them to me and leave my house sir henry said holding up his thin white hand i i will on one condition if i may be allowed to go we shall not prevent your leaving was the baronet's calm reply the man fumbled nervously in the inner pocket of his coat and at last brought out a sealed and rather bulgy foolscap envelope open it gabrielle and see what is within her father said she obeyed and in a few moments explained the various documents it contained then let the man go her father said but sir henry cried hamilton i object to this crail is down in the village forming a plot to make you pay for the return of those papers he arrived from london by the same train as this man if we allow him to leave he will inform his accomplice and both will escape murray had his back to the door the long window on the opposite side of the room being closed it was a promise of sir henry's declared the unhappy adventurer which will be observed when crail has been brought face to face with sir henry answered murray at the same time calling hill and one of the gardeners who chanced to be working on the lawn outside then with a firmness which showed that they were determined hamilton and murray conducted flockhart to a small upstairs room where hill and the gardener with the assistance of stuart who happened to have come into the kitchen mounted guard over him his position once the honoured guest at glencardine was the most ignominious conceivable but sir henry sat in gratification that at least he had got back those documents and saved the reputation of his friend Volkonsky, as well as that of his co-partners End of chapter thirty seven chapter thirty eight of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain that man's voice stokes the chauffeur had driven murray and hamilton in the car to the village where the last named after a conversation with the police inspector went to the Drathaven arms together with two constables who happened to be off duty in plain clothes they found crail sitting in the bar calmly smoking awaiting a message from his accomplice upon hamilton's recognition he was after a brief argument 
arrested on the charge of theft from glencardine placed in the car between the two stalwart scotch policemen and conveyed in triumph to the castle much of course against his will he demanded to be taken straight to the police station but as sir henry ordered him to be brought to glencardine and as sir henry was a magistrate the inspector was bound to obey his orders the man's cruel colourless eyes seemed to contract closer as he sat in the car with his enemy hamilton facing him he had never dreamed that they would ever meet again but now they had he saw that the game was up there was no hope of escape he was being taken to meet sir henry Hayburn, the very last man in all of the world he wished to face his sallow countenance was drawn his lips were thin and bloodless and upon his cheeks were two red spots which showed that he was now in deadly terror gabrielle who had been weeping at the knees of her father heard the whir of the car coming up the drive and springing to the window witnessed the arrival of the party a moment later crail between the two constables and with the local inspector standing respectfully at the rear stood in the big long library into which the blind man was led by his daughter when all had assembled sir henry in a clear distinct voice said i have had you arrested and brought here in order to charge you with stealing certain documents from my safe yonder which you opened by means of a duplicate key your accomplice flockhart has given evidence against you therefore to deny it is quite needless whatever he has said to you is lies the foreigner replied his accent being the more pronounced in his excitement i know nothing about it if you deny that exclaimed hamilton quickly you will also perhaps deny that it was you who secretly poisoned miss bryant in the pont tourme forest even though i myself saw you at the spot and further that a witness had been found who actually saw you substitute the wine bottles you intended to kill me what ridiculous nonsense you are talking cried the accused who was dressed with his habitual shabby gentility the girl yonder mademoiselle killed miss bryant then why did you make that deliberate attempt upon my life at fotheringay demanded the girl boldly had it not been for mr hamilton who must have seen us together and guessed that you intended foul play i should certainly have been drowned he believed that you knew his secret and he intended both on his own behalf and on flockhart's is also to close your lips murray said with you out of the way their attitude toward your father would have been easier but with you still a living witness there was always danger to them he thought your death would be believed to be suicide for he knew your despondent state of mind sir henry stood near the window his face sphinx-like as though turned to stone she fell in was his lame excuse no you threw me in declared the girl but i have feared you until now and i therefore dared not to give information against you ah god alone knows how i have suffered you dare now eh he snarled turning quickly upon her it really does not matter what you deny or what you admit hamilton remarked the french authorities have applied for your extradition to france and this evening you will be on your way to the extradition court at bow street charged with a graver offence than the burglary at this house the surete of paris make several interesting allegations against you or against felix gerlock which is your real name gerlock cried the blind man in a loud voice groping forward ah he shrieked then i was not mistaken when when i thought i recognized the voice that man's voice yes it is his his in an instant crail had sprung forward towards the blind and defenceless man but his captors were fortunately too quick and prevented him then at the inspector's orders a pair of steel bracelets were quickly placed upon his wrists gerlock felix gerlock repeated the blind baronet as though to himself as he heard the snap of the lock upon the prisoner's wrists the fellow burst out in a peal of, of harsh discordant laughter he was endeavouring to retain a defiant attitude even then you apparently know this man dad gabrielle exclaimed in surprise know him echoed her father hoarsely no felix gerlach yes i have bitter cause to remember the man who stands there before you accused of the crime of murder then he paused and drew a long breath 
i unmasked him once as a thief and a swindler and he swore to be avenged said the baronet in a bitter voice it was long ago he came to me in london and offered me a concession which he said he had obtained from the ottoman government for the construction of a railroad from smyrna to the bosphorus the documents appeared to be all right and in order and after some negotiations he sold the concession to me and received ten thousand pounds in cash of the purchase money in advance a week afterwards i discovered that though the concession had been granted by the minister of public works at the sublime port it had been sold to the ekman group in vienna and the papers i held were merely copies with forged signatures and stamps i applied to the police this man was arrested in hamburg and brought back to london where he was tried and a previous conviction having been proved against him sent to penal servitude for seven years in the dock at the old bailey he swore to be avenged upon me and upon my family and he seems to have kept his word walter remarked when he came out of prison he found me in the zenith of my political career sir henry went on on that well-remembered night at the albert hall i can only surmise that he went there heard me and probably became fiercely resentful that he had found a man cleverer than himself the fact remains that he must have gone in a cab in front of my carriage to park street alighted before me and secreted himself within the portico it was midnight and the street was deserted my carriage stopped i got out and it then drove on to the mews i was in the act of opening the door with my latch-key when by an unknown hand there was full flung into my eyes some corrosive fluid which burned terribly and caused me excruciating pain i heard a man's exultant voice cry there i promised you that and you have it the voice i recognized as that of the blackguard standing before you since that moment he added in a blank hoarse voice i have been totally blind you got me seven years cried the foreigner with a harsh laugh so think yourself very lucky that i didn't kill you you placed upon me an affliction a perpetual darkness that to a man like myself is almost akin to death replied his accuser very gravely secure from recognition you wormed yourself into the confidence of my wife for you were bent upon ruining her also and you took as partner in your schemes that needy adventurer flockart i now see it all quite plainly hamilton had recognized you as gerlach and you therefore formed a plot to get rid of him and throw the crime upon my poor unfortunate daughter even though she was scarcely more than a child in all probability lady heyburn in telling the girl the story regarding murray and miss bryant believed it and if so she would also suspect my daughter to be the actual criminal this is utterly astounding dad cried gabrielle if you knew who it was who deliberately blinded you why didn't you prosecute him because there were no witness of his dastardly act my child and i myself never saw him therefore i was compelled to remain in silence and allow the world to believe my affliction due to natural causes was his blank response the sallow-faced foreigner laughed again laughed in the face of the man whose eyesight he had so deliberately taken he could not speak what had he to say well remarked hamilton we have at least the satisfaction of knowing that both this man and his accomplice will stand their trial for their heartless crime in france and that they will meet their just punishment according to the laws of god and of man and i added walter in a voice broken by emotion as he again took gabrielle's hand tenderly have the supreme satisfaction of knowing that my darling is cleared of a foul dastardly and terrible charge End of chapter 38chapter thirty nine of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain contains the conclusion after a long consultation crail having been removed in custody back to the village it was agreed that the only charges that could be substantiated against flockhart were those of complicity in the ingenious attempt upon hamilton's life by which poor miss bryant had been sacrificed and also in the theft of sir henry's papers but was it worth while at the baronet's suggestion he was allowed freedom to leave the upstairs room where he had been detained by the three stalwart servants 
and without waiting to speak to anyone, he had made his way down the drive. He had, as was afterwards found, left Octeradar Station for London an hour later. The painful impression produced upon everybody by Sir Henry's statement of what had actually occurred on the night of the great meeting at the Albert Hall having somewhat subsided. Murray mentioned to the blind man the legend of the whispers, and also the curious discovery which Gabrielle and he had made earlier in the morning. Ah, laughed the old gentleman a trifle uneasily, and so you've discovered the truth at last, eh? The truth? No, Murray said. That is just what we are so very anxious to hear from you, Sir Henry. Well, he said, you may rest your minds perfectly content that there is nothing supernatural about them. It was to my own advantage to cause weird reports and uncanny legends to be spread in order to preserve my secret, the secret of the whispers. But what is the secret, Sir Henry? asked Hamilton eagerly. We, curiously enough, have similar whispers at Hetzendorf. I've heard them myself at the old chateau. And, of course, you have believed in the story which my good friend the baron has caused to spread. Like myself, the legend that those who hear them die quickly and suddenly, said the old man, with a smile upon his gray face. Like myself, he wished to keep away all inquisitive persons from the spot. But why? asked Murray. Well, truth to tell, the reason is very simple, he answered. As we are speaking here in the strictest privacy, I will tell you something, which I beg that neither of you will repeat. If you do, it might result in my ruin. Murray, Hamilton, and Gabrielle all gave their promise. Then it is this, he said. I am head of a group of the leading financial houses in Europe, who, remaining secret, are carrying on business in the guise of an unimportant house in Paris. The members of the syndicate, are all of them men of enormous financial strength, including Baron de Hetzendorf, to whom our friend Hamilton here acts as a confidential secretary. The strictest secrecy is necessary for the success of our great undertakings, which I may add are perfectly honest and legitimate. Yet never, unless absolutely imperative, do we entrust documents or letters to the post. Like the House of Rothschild, we have our confidential messengers and hold frequent meetings, no deal being undertaken without we are all of us in full accord. Monsieur Goslin acts as a confidential messenger and brings me the views of my partners in Paris, Petersburg, and Vienna. To this careful concealment of our plans, or of the fact that we are ever in touch with one another, is due the huge successes we have made from time to time successes which have staggered the bourses of the continent and caused amazement in wall street but being unfortunately afflicted as i am i naturally cannot travel to meet the others and besides we are compelled always to take fresh and most elaborate precautions in order to conceal the fact that we are in connection with each other if that one fact ever leaked out it would at once stultify our endeavors and weaken our position hence at intervals two or three even of my partners travel here, and I meet them at night in the little chamber which you, Walter, discovered today, and which until the present has never been found, owing to the weird fables I have invented regarding the whispers. To Hetzendorf, too, once or twice a year, perhaps, the members pay a secret visit in order to consult the Baron, who, as you perhaps may know, unfortunately enjoys very precarious health. The meetings of Fronmeyer volkonsky and the rest were held here in secret sometimes echoed hamilton in surprise on certain occasions when it is absolutely necessary that i should meet them answered sir henry they stay at the station hotel in perth coming over to octeradar by the last train at night and leaving by the first train in the morning from creef junction they never approach the house for fear that servants or one or another of the guests may recognize them but go separately along the glen and up to the path to the ruins. When we thus meet, our voices can be heard through the crack in the roof of the chamber in the courtyard above. On such occasions, I take good care that Stuart and his men are sent on a false alarm of poachers to another part of the estate. While I can find my way there myself with my stick, he laughed. The baron, I believe, acts on the same principle at his chateau in Hungary. Well, declared Hamilton, 
so well has the baron kept the secret that i have never had any suspicion until this moment by jove the invention of the whispers was certainly a clever mode of preserving the secret for nobody cares deliberately to court disaster and death especially among a superstitious populace like the villagers here and the hungarian peasantry both gabrielle and her lover expressed their astonishment the latter remarking how cleverly the weird legend of the whispers invented by sir henry had been made to fit historical fact when the eight o'clock train from stirling stopped at octeradar station that evening a tall well-dressed man alighted and inquired his way to the police station the porter knew by his accent that he was a londoner but did not dream that he was a gentleman from scotland yard half an hour later after a chat with the rural inspector the pair went along to the cell behind the small village police station in order that the stranger should read over to the prisoner the warrant he had brought with him from london the application of the french police for the arrest and extradition of felix gerlach alias crail alias benoit for the wilful murder of edna mary bryant in the forest of pontarme near chantilly the inspector had related to the london detective the dramatic scene at the glencardine that day and the officer of the criminal investigation department walked along the cell much interested to see what manner of man was this who was even more bold and ingenious in his criminal methods than many with whom his profession brought him daily into contact he had hoped that he himself would have the credit of making the arrest but found that the man wanted had already been apprehended on the charge of burglary at glencardine the inspector unlocked the door and threw it open but next the startling truth became plain felix crail lay dead upon the flagstones he had taken his life by poison probably the same poison he had placed in the wine at the fatal picnic rather than face his accuser and bear his just punishment many months have now passed a good deal has occurred since that never-to-be-forgotten day but it is all quickly related james flockhart unmasked as he had been never dared to return the last heard of him was six months ago in honduras where for the first time in his life he had been compelled to work for his living and had three weeks after landing succumbed to fever at sir henry's urgent request his wife came back to glencardine a week after the tragic end of gerlach and was compelled to make full confession how under the man's sinister influence both she and flockart had been forced to act to her husband she proved beyond all doubt that she had been in complete ignorance of the truth concerning the affair in the pontarme forest until long afterwards she had at first believed gabrielle guilty of the deed but when she learned the truth and saw how deeply she had been implicated it was impossible for her then to withdraw with a whole-hearted generosity seldom found in men sir henry after long reflection and a desperate struggle with himself forgave her and now has the satisfaction of knowing that she prefers quiet healthful glencardine to the social gaieties of park street paris or san remo while she and gabrielle have lately become devoted to each other the secret syndicate with sir henry hayburn at its head still operates for no word of its existence has leaked out to either financial circles or to the public while the whispers of glencardine are still believed in and dreaded by the whole countryside across the ochils edgar hamilton though compelled to return to the baron whose right hand he is often travels to glencardine with confidential messages and documents for signature and is of course an ever welcome guest the unpretentious house of lenard et morellet of paris now and then affects deals so enormous that financial circles are staggered and the world stands amazed the true facts of who is actually behind that apparently unimportant firm are however still rigorously and ingeniously concealed who would ever dream that that quiet grey-faced man with the sightless eyes living far away up in scotland passing his hours of darkness with his old bronze seals or his knitting was the brain which directed their marvellously successful operations the laird of conachan died quite suddenly about seven months ago and walter murray succeeded to the noble estate gabrielle sweet almost childlike in her simple tastes and delightful charm and more devoted to walter than ever is now little lady murray having been married in edinburgh a month ago 
at the moment that i pen these final lines the pair are spending a blissful honeymoon at the great old chateau of hetzendorf high up above the broad flowing danube the baron having kindly vacated the place and put it at their disposal for the summer happy in each other's love and mutual trust they spend the long blissful days in company wandering often hand in hand for when walter looks into those wonderful eyes of hers he sees mirrored there a perfect and abiding affection such as indeed given few men to possess together they have in secret explored the ruins of the ancient stronghold and by directions given them by the baron have found there a stone chamber by no means dissimilar to that at glencardine meanwhile sir henry Hayburn, impatient for his beloved daughter to be again near him and to assist him passes his weary hours with his favourite hobby his wife full of sympathy bearing him company from her however he still withholds one secret and the one only the secret of the house of whispers end of chapter thirty nine end of the house of whispers by william lacroix read by april six zero nine zero california united states of america